trauma is being transmitted throughout generations. All the historical traumas, the Second World War, the First World War, slavery and racism in the U.S., the Native American genocide in the U.S., that unconscious collective trauma is co-designing our society and is co-designing organizations and workplaces. But it's co-designing it without being overt. It's not visible. The hurt has not been made explicit to us as children. We saw our parents fighting. We saw teachers doing crazy things. We see politicians do crazy things. And then we say, oh, that's how the world is. No, that's partly how the world is when it's hurt. Then we see all kinds of symptoms that seem like life, but they are not just life, they are life when it's hurt. And I think once we make that explicit, we can also begin to care for it. But if we don't put our attention there, it will just repeat itself. Welcome to the Work for Humans podcast. This is Dart Lindsley. Thomas Hubel has firsthand experience with the deep-rooted nature of collective trauma, from engaging with Israeli descendants of Holocaust survivors to coaching executives to international firms. He has experienced just how deeply ingrained and persistent collective trauma can be in society. For over 20 years, Thomas has been dedicated to leading dialogues on collective trauma across generations, professions, and cultures. Thomas is a respected teacher, author, and international facilitator specializing in healing collective trauma and producing cultural change within systems. With over two decades of experience, he's influenced over 100,000 individuals worldwide through his writing, his teaching, and his workshops. In this episode, Thomas and I talk about trauma in all forms, from intergenerational and collective trauma to trauma within companies. We also discuss key takeaways from the book Attuned, Post-Traumatic Learning and Healing, what it feels like to work in a healthy company, and other topics. As always, if you find this episode valuable, be sure to subscribe to Work for Humans wherever you listen to podcasts. And now, I present my conversation with Thomas Hubel. Thomas Hubel, welcome to Work for Humans. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Work for Humans is a show about how we might design work better. The experience of work, our life at work, our spirits at work. And when I ask the question of different people, like I do on the show, what needs to change for work to be better? Some people say technology. Some people say policies. Some people say processes. But for others, the answer to the question is oneself. That is oneself that one needs to work on for work to be better. And so Shalini Verma, who you know, came on the show. And that's the way she answered the question. Her show was about trauma-informed management. It immediately became the most popular episode I've ever produced. And it stayed that way ever since. And so when she was wildly enthusiastic, which she is, about your work, I wanted to know more. And so thank you very much for taking the time to talk today. I want to start by talking about your book, Attunement. Let's start by what inspired you to write that book. Let's see. I've been working on collective trauma all around the world for more than 20 years, 20, 25 years. I wrote my first book, Healing Collective Trauma, about what is systemic trauma, because trauma often is seen as a very personal experience or issue. And I wanted to make a point that it's also systemic. And that's why I think it's also relevant for organizations. And then I wanted to write a book that addresses more our personal capacity to develop the remedy for trauma, which is relationships or the capacity to relate. And attunement is a way how we train our nervous systems to be more relational. So then I thought, Okay, let's call the book Attuned, and let's talk about the various ways how we create real psychological safety, because psychological safety is a buzzword, but I'm not sure that we always know how to create it. And so the attunement of one nervous system with another it creates safety. When we feel felt, I feel you, and I feel how you feel me right now, 
That's the data connection between us. And then communication is what happens within that data connection. And I think if the data connection is a bit choppy, the communication is also not that great. But if it's open and flowing, then it feels much more conducive to true understanding. So that and the process of individual ancestral and collective trauma and trauma healing was very important for me to frame in one book. And so these two aspects, attunement, relational capacity as our superpower to deal with trauma was my motivation. Fundamentally, what is trauma? Yeah, trauma has been stigmatized and often misunderstood. When we speak about trauma, we are not speaking about the adverse situation or the difficulty or the very life-threatening situation we are surviving. We are talking about the internal mechanism. We can call this also the trauma response. So what happens in an individual or a group, an organization, a society, a country, when something strongly overwhelming happens to us, or we experience something strongly overwhelming, it means the computer is overloaded. And the trauma response, I believe, is actually a super intelligent mechanism that helps us to survive better. But it has a price that we pay later. But in that moment, the trauma response tries to save us, and it's thousands and thousands of years old. So evolution developed that mechanism because many of our ancestors had traumatizing experiences. So we are not the first ones that experience trauma. We just call it that way now. And what happens in the nervous system is that there is an excessive stress. That stress leads to strong fight, flight, or freeze responses. And there's another mechanism that says, okay, there's such a strong overload that we are able to shut down the overload to still act in a way and save ourselves or get through the situation better. And from the moment we shut down, that part gets dissociated and shut down. So there's two. From that moment on, we are looking through like a window with a crack. And that's why the trauma symptoms, when we get triggered, we often say, why am I so overreacting in some situations? Yeah, because When something pushes that unconscious trauma that lives from that day on in me, then I get either very stressed out and I start to express fight or flight symptoms. I either become very angry or I want to go out and go away. Or I become numb, absent, indifferent, shut down. I don't find my voice. I feel mute. I don't speak up when I need to say something. And so I'm getting disengaged. Engaged. And so these two symptoms we see very often in society, you see either a lot of fire or you see indifference. And so in organizations, that also happens often, and that's a bit of a sand in the engine of social systems. And one of the things you wrote is that it's not the shocking thing that happened to you, it's your reaction to what happened. And to me, that sounds very much like a scar. It's not the cut. It's the remainder. It's the thing, the way it healed over, but healed over incompletely. What does it mean to be attuned? What it means to be attuned is the parts of my nervous system that are open. We can see the nervous system as a data flow. It's like a great Wi-Fi system that informs our whole body and informs how we experience the world. So it's flowing. Where my nervous system is not traumatized and is open, I can feel you. I can feel you. My body can feel your body. My emotions pick up on your emotions. My mind understands your mind. We are sitting in a space that feels close together. We can explore. We can even disagree in that space. And it's still we are together. So attunement, It's like when you listen to music. Every time we listen to music, we attune to music. And even if you sing, you hear a song that you like and you sing along, so you're attuning to the different tunes of the music. And relational attunement is the same. When I feel you, I'm feeling your movement. 
because your nervous system is also moving. So there's one river, there's another river, and there's a confluence. And that's how we feel each other. But where I carry pain myself, or I'm a bit withdrawn, or I carry a lot of stress in myself, it's harder for me to feel you. So that's why attunement is often compromised or limited. And these are the areas where we can recreate some trauma from the past again between us. But attunement is resonance, is fluid resonance between us. I want to understand collective trauma better. Part of what I want to know is, where does it reside? Is it in each of us? Or is it something that is between us? If you could give an example of collective trauma, and potentially the collective trauma that you witnessed that led you into this field. Let's say what led me into the deeper studying and deeper work on collective trauma was that in my groups that I ran in Europe, a lot of times the Holocaust and the Second World War played a big role. And then I understood two things. I mean, that I intellectually understood maybe before, but that I more viscerally or experientially understood in beings in spaces where that came up over and over again, is on the one hand, how trauma is being transmitted throughout generations. So people that have survivor ancestors of the Holocaust, for example, or people that have ancestors that were part of the SS or the Nazi regime in Germany. So how either the trauma of the transgression or the trauma of being victimized is living on and is being passed on through the generations. So that was one thing I much more understood in the process work with people. And then the second thing is that I understood, okay, we are all living in the archaeology. All the historical traumas, the Second World War, the First World War, the Civil War in the U.S. and uh, slavery and racism in the U.S., the Native American genocide in the U.S., that creates layers of trauma where the data... The relational data cannot flow, the narrative is broken, and all kinds of traumatic side effects keep happening, the repetition compulsion of trauma. And then I understood, wow, we often talk about trauma as if it belongs to space and time of a person's individual attachment process or, the, I don't know, like a war. But actually, we could call collective trauma the sum, the system of trauma that we live in as humanity. And there are big wounds that, of course, add layer by layer by layer to that system. And then it got clearer and clearer to me how that unconscious collective trauma is designing, co-designing our society and is co-designing organizations and workplaces. But it's co-designing it without being overt. It's not visible. That's the point. And because we grew up in a collectively hurt world that is partly healthy and partly hurt, the hurt has not been made explicit to us as children. We saw our parents fighting. We saw teachers doing crazy things. We see politicians do crazy things. And then we say, oh, that's how the world is. And I would say, no, that's partly how the world is when it's hurt. Then we see all kinds of symptoms that seem like life, but they are not just life, they are life and it's hurt. And I think once we make that explicit, we can also begin to care for it. But if we don't put our attention there, it will just repeat itself. As Sigmund Freud said, unconscious trauma is subject to the repetition compulsion. And that's what we see. We see conflicts come up periodically, and it takes maybe 50 years, it takes 100 years, but it will replay itself. And we see intimate relationship dialogues again and again, or in organizations, we say, oh, we say A, but then it's not happening. And then we talk about why didn't it happen? And it didn't happen. And it didn't happen. So cyclic conversations that don't seem to evolve, and I call this non-emergent processes, they are not growing. They're stuck in time. And so systemic trauma, I think, is a very important understanding of why we see certain symptoms in collective systems, organizations, societies. And we can work with that to create change, to create more well-being, to create more development and change capacity. 
I like that phrase, non-emergent systems, which tend to be loops, right? That they are self-replicating without progressing. Mm -hmm. I spent some time in Cambodia and I experienced what you're talking about, which is that one of the people I spoke to there said, every family has killers and the killed from that genocide. So it was every family was on both sides of that conflict. And the sense of pervasive tragedy that existed there, and it was even in the geography, which is, I was standing at the top of a mountain and it was a cliff, and I said, this is a beautiful view. And the person I was talking to said, yes, this is a killing place, because this was a place where they threw people after they'd killed them is off this cliff. And so every place that she saw around her, it was in the very geography of where she lived. One of the things I worry about when we anchor on trauma is the idea that trauma is one of our central characteristics. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Is there something like the opposite of collective trauma, which is collective good? And the reason I say that is because there's a part of me that doesn't want to start off my whole being with the idea of victimhood. And I sort of want to balance the conversation about saying that one is more than a history of trauma or one's traumas. One is also a history of goodness. But I don't know if that's a part of what you work with. Absolutely. That's what we call in the trauma work resourcing. And what we get from our ancestors is obviously not only trauma. I mean, if you look at the body, you can say, which is, I think, the prevailing interpretation is, oh, your body is as old as it's written in your passport. But you could also say, no, your body is millions of years old. None of us invented this body. All the organs, all the cells, all the emotions, all the thought processes that this body is able to be part of a democracy or of a world, a society, means so much development happened throughout tens and hundreds of thousands of years and more that the complexity that we are is so much more obviously than our trauma because there's so much learning and there's so much healing of adversity over thousands of years. If you just look back in history, how much trauma we already healed and integrated and turned into post-traumatic learning is amazing. And I think the self-healing mechanism of our bodies and our biological systems is a result of that constant healing and learning. So to your point, I think very much so, we work with the power that we are anchored in that is the collective good or that is the part of us that is what I call integrated. And we are aware that often we are shadow fighting symptoms that come up in all kinds of systems that I think we don't address in the right way and we can be much faster in resolving certain things when we address it on the right level. But certainly, I think we are, and I would even argue, when you go through the forest and I ask you, where is nature? Nature is not just around us, nature is through us because my body, I am also nature. There's the deer, and there's the rabbit, and there's the bird, and there's Thomas. I am also nature. I'm a biological system as much as every tree and every being in the forest. And when we ask where is society, society is not just all the other people. Society is through us, but often we don't experience it that way. But in fact, we are the ecosystem. You know, my body is the planet. Your body is the planet. It's not just something else, like a cup <laughs> in the cupboard. So I think that the integration of trauma on different levels, individual, ancestral, and collective trauma, just reveals again the interdependence, like that individuals and ecosystems are interdependent wholes. And so it really matters how we talk to each other. It really matters how much waste we throw into the ecosystem because eventually 
It will end up in our food chain. It will end up in our social systems that come back to us. And we eat what we produce. And so when we look into organizations, that's true too. If you create a very toxic environment around yourself, you will eat toxicity. And if you are generous and you are connected and you're willing to resolve and you're transparent and authentic, you'll create that kind of ecosystem around yourself. And so I'm very much with you that we want to work because that's the only way how to heal trauma. And then trauma healing is post-traumatic learning and it adds to the collective good. So it actually gets transformed into more of the collective good that we want to see in our world. And I believe at the base of trauma healing, we actually create more ownership of trauma and of transgressions. And we enter an ethical healing process too, because often trauma has been inflicted through transgressions of ethics. And so I believe the healing and the learning, the post-traumatic learning is actually an ethical upgrade. And I guess right now in the world, we are dealing with AI, we are dealing with nanotechnology, we are dealing with all kinds of genetic engineering. Having a solid ethical grounding, I think is very important. And, and some of that learning we didn't have yet because it's still frozen in the collective trauma. I love the phrase post-traumatic learning. It's a very powerful phrase. So first of all, one of the things that is throughout your writing is this idea that our edges are not our skin, <laughs> which is that, sure, our edges are our skin, but there's a signal that's flowing through us. Maybe our physical edges are our skin, but we're receiving signal and that we need to recognize that we are much more connected and much more broadly connected than we normally consider. And so when I think about a company and what it's like to be inside a company, how does trauma occur and manifest inside a company? And a part of the reason I ask is because I argue that we're all bigger than the companies we are in, which is that every single one of us is more complex than the company that we're in. And a part of the reason I believe that is because the company is largely a manufactured object, and we can only manufacture things that are of a certain complexity. And so how does trauma arrive to a company? I often say, when people say, that's the stress at the workplace, <laughs> I often say, yeah, of course, there's stress at the workplace. But when we look at it a bit closer, it's like every one of us brings a lunch package of stress to the workplace. And then we are having lunch together, and we call it stress at the workplace. But we need to also look a bit at the root cause, why we are experiencing it, co-producing stress, and why we often create organizations that their structures produce that. So three elements. And when we look at it, many of us experience some kind of either big T trauma or small T trauma. So it's not always the same intensity, but many of us experience that we get triggered. Sometimes when we get triggered, we get either very stressed out, or maybe aggressive, or maybe we get very scared. Or maybe we become very distant. We become indifferent. We pull back. We are not anymore fully part of what's happening. And all of that, I would argue, are trauma symptoms of certain intensities. So every one of us that works in an organization already contributes some to it. And we contribute a certain capacity to deal with it. So when we sit in team meetings, somebody says something, the other person feels ashamed or exposed and retracts, and then there is a animosity or friction or there's a conflict between them. Many of these processes, if there are thousands of people having such kind of processes, then the trauma affects the way the workflow and the intelligence of the collective is processing the workflow. It kind of downgrades a bit the collective intelligence. And sometimes organizations also go through traumatic events like strong layoffs, cost cuts, 
scandals that they have or organizations that did a lot of environmental harm or social harm. And even COVID, look at COVID. We had two years of crazy global pandemic that did so much change in the world, but we didn't stop and say, hey, wait a moment, let's just slow down for a moment and see what happened to us now. Where is our capacity to digest? And so often we are so driven and there is a difference between urgency and trauma stress. Trauma stress is a non-sustainable way of working, living, creating societies, and also creating an economy world that is actually exhausting natural resources. But that's what trauma stress does in everybody. So if we carry it inside, how do we want to create a society that is sustainable if we cannot even live sustainably in our body? So that's one thing to think about. That's why what Jeleni said also in the conversation with you is it starts with us. It needs a change inside that we are able to create systems that reflect the way we want to live together or want to work together. And the other thing is that once I know, okay, sometimes things are urgent, but in a regulated nervous system, there can be urgency. There can be lots of intense projects. That's great. But if I cannot sleep because of that, or if it affects my family life, or if it affects my health, then something doesn't work in the regulation. And then my nervous system needs to learn something. And so I think there are many ways how trauma affects organizations, because many of us carry some trauma, and organizations experience trauma, but we don't often make the space to say, oh, there was a big layoff. Many people feel scared. That creates a distrust between employees and organizations. Let's slow down for a moment. Let's create big spaces where we listen to each other. Let's create a space where I want to hear how you feel with the fact that 2,000 people have been fired. And let's digest this. It's like we all understand that food needs to be digested, but we often don't make the space that the psychological impact that we experience in certain situations needs to be digested and integrated. And I think that's a function of a regulated nervous system knows when I need to slow down for a moment, digest what I experienced, and then speed up again. And I think at least in many organizations that I see when I work in organizations, that that muscle of digesting the impact that certain things have in the organization or outside, or also organizations that did a lot of harm in whatever, indigenous populations, to heal that and restore that is very important for healthy ecosystems. And I think that's one element that needs to be strengthened in many organizations, that we see that both speeding up is important, but sometimes slowing down to integrate something that we can live even more sustainably together. And I think employee motivation, trust, psychological safety, creativity will grow when we do that. I think I've seen those things. And some that you didn't mention, too, which is that layoffs, for instance, create a sense of betrayal and a sense of fear. And so there's this residue where people will overreact out of fear. I've also seen it where a company goes into a market and they fail in that market. And from then on, they are terrified of that market. In other words, there might be another opportunity there, but they actually have a fear. And it's because they committed a lot of their time and their energy and their passion to something that ultimately wasn't successful and was shut down. And they don't want to go back to that place. So I see that in organizations. And not only that, but if you're new to the organization and you don't know that that trauma is there, you might say, let's go into that market. And you don't know why nobody can even talk to you about that. They're like, no, we can't go into that market. And so the whole organization has a memory. Absolutely. When you say that a company or an organization has darkness in it, what do you mean? What I mean is absence. So let's say the first time I flew to Kathmandu, to the Himalayas, and I sat on the plane and I looked down at Kathmandu and I said, 
Wow, that's very interesting. Because in Kathmandu, they need to turn off the electricity in quarters of the city to save electricity. For three, four hours, they save electricity in different quarters. And then I said, wow, it's so interesting. I'm sitting here on the plane. I look down. I see a web of light. It's a city at night. And there is this dark spot, this black spot. And because it's night, so I cannot tell you if that spot is a mountain, if that spot is a lake, a forest, or if that's part of the city that I simply cannot see. But if it's a part of the city, people live there with candles in their houses or flats. And then I thought, wow, that's a genius explanation for the unconscious. It's like inverse information. Something's happening there, but without the consciousness of the self, the one who experiences it. But also, your unconscious spots and my unconscious spots have a party while we are speaking here, but without us knowing. So even saying there is something like an individual unconscious is partly true and partly not, because the individual unconscious cannot survive without partnerships without other contracts around. And so when we talk about the health of social systems is when there is awareness, this is the part of the organization that we see. And we can make lots of assumptions about what we see, but there are no post-it stickers to the part of the organization that we don't see that is having effects and every organization has shadow sides, has biases, either racial biases, gender biases, whatever, all kinds of biases that are results of not being aware and not having done the right work to open those up. I think more and more innovative organizations are putting a lot of their resources in opening those biases so that, first of all, it's a more diverse, inclusive environment. And it also takes care of exactly what you said. I also saw this in organizations that you see, like we are talking about something, but we are hitting a strange, dense area. I say, what's happening? And what's happening is that we are hitting a prior small or large organizational trauma that there's a place where we can't go. But when we cannot go there, we project the past into the future. So we limit ourselves by experiences of the past. Had we had a process that integrates that, as you said before, the fear to go into this market, it would generate organizational post-traumatic learning, which makes us wiser as an organization. So yeah, there was something that didn't work. We really look at it. We integrate it until we are not afraid anymore. And then we can feel if it's right or not to go there again. But that's much more open. And I think that often doesn't happen. And also layoffs that then we see a dispersion, a bit of a fragmentation in the organization. People become less committed, more with themselves because of the fear. And that's not good for a collective purpose. That's not good for a collective motivation to really work for the higher purpose of an organization. So I, I'm very much with you, but that I think it's very important that we don't know what we don't see. And we need to be humble to a certain extent to reveal the unseen aspects of human systems. This is an unusual question. I want to talk about mysticism as a legitimate way of knowing. And the reason I bring it up is that the word mysticism is used to sort of throw away people's ideas. Ah, oh, that's just mysticism. On the other hand, in the history of knowing, mysticism has had a place. And you refer to it in your book. And you also speak a lot about contemplative practices. One of the phrases I love in this book is that contemplative practices allow us to host others within ourselves, which I think is an incredible phrase. How do you think of mysticism as a way of knowing? That's a beautiful question. First of all, as you said it already, let's imagine thousands of years, people 
practicing contemplative practices, meditation, prayers, all kinds of spiritual practices to deepen something in themselves. Thousands of years, many, many people in lineages, being it Tibetan Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, or other free spiritual practices. So there must be something. And then until neuroscience showed us that meditation is good for us, and now mindfulness is such a buzzword, for thousands of years, mystics or people in those traditions said that. So it's not that it was entirely new. Now science gives their kosher stamp and say, okay, that's a good thing. <laughs> okay? So there was a, some kind of knowing already, like a wisdom in us. And let's say that wisdom traditions all around the world have a certain level of knowing that is generated through intimacy with the process. And there is conventional science that has experimentation as a way of knowing, which is very legitimate, but deep internal guided processes that are being supervised generation after generation also have a legitimacy. This is also an experimentation. And so what the wisdom traditions also teach us that what in modern terms we call authenticity is a congruency in our own nervous system. The transparency and honesty and compassion and love and presence are things that we would put, in your words, into the category of the collective good. I think many people would agree. And that the wisdom traditions say developing compassion so that we experience less hatred and more capacity to include, as you said, to host and to create uh, unification or create connectivity, these are all great things. And on a deeper level, and I think also science is getting there slowly, that a way of perception that when we are really present with each other, we feel each other, we can get to very deep places. And I experience that every day when we do trauma processes, developmental or ancestral or collective trauma processes, the level of attunement that we often have and how deeply we can feel each other and tap into the information that resides in our nervous systems is like biocomputers connecting and bringing the same information to the display. And I have seen this thousands and thousands of times. And that many people experience these things. You walk into a room, you feel an atmosphere, you talk to a person, and suddenly you say something that you didn't plan on saying, but it actually really met the moment. So I think there are many of these incidents that we can cynically brush off, or we can say something's happening there, and our biocomputers, like our wholeness, is very, very intelligent. They are very, very intelligent. So we, as you said, we are much more complex than it sometimes seems like. And there, there are millions of years of development in that biocomputer. And so I think the tremendous amount of information that is there is incredible. And I think we are literally subject to a notion of hyper-individualism, especially in some cultures, where the intoxication with hyper-individualism is really creating a lot of separation, loneliness, isolation, and that limits that kind of knowing that is based on the interconnectedness of life. And yeah, so this is just the beginning. I mean, this is a big subject. <laughs> Mysticism is a big subject. But... <laughs> it is. And it's not one thing either. Yeah. There's a lot of different practices about which I know virtually nothing, except to recognize that there are multiple artists approach knowing differently than scientists in many cases, for instance. What is the individuation loop that you describe in the book? Because you were talking about just now how people can retreat into individuation. You describe an, an individuation loop. What is that? Yeah, that's a bit of a complex process, but to make it simple. I think we all go through our childhood development through different phases in different functions and also overall as until we mature. We are a mature human being. 
And what we essentially go through is from a very dependent state, where literally a baby is fundamentally dependent, to more and more autonomy, independence, and then that independence develops into interdependence. So that I can bring the autonomy movement back into authentic, deep, honest, clear relationships and be part of a society, an organization, a family system, a new family that I create. And all of that depends on my state of maturity. So leadership needs a lot of integration so that we are in a state of interdependence. And that's, I think, the most mature version of human being that we can be in order to lead, for example, organizations. And another way to describe it, I use one example very often. So emotional maturation comes through that babies need to be co-regulated or small children in order to internalize a good level of nervous system regulation that becomes self-regulation that we can then pass on to the next generation as co-regulation. And like this, from generation to generation, we pass on the capacity to be in a regulated state, which means to be stressed at times, down-regulated stress, be able to relax and go stay a lot in a, what we call the social engagement system, open. So when we look at childhood development, I often say, as an example, when my daughter comes to me and says, Daddy, Daddy, I'm really scared. And let's say I'm a bit busy, I have many things to do, I'm anyway a bit stressed. And then I, I say to her, yeah, don't be scared. There is no danger in the house, let's say. So don't be scared. There's no reason for it. So what did I do? I devalued don't be scared. I devalued her emotion. She clearly comes with an emotional request. I'm scared. And I give her an intellectual answer when she has an emotional and physical request. I'm stressed. I'm scared. So the other version would be, I turn to my daughter when she comes, Daddy, Daddy, I'm scared. I turn to her. I feel her. And I say, yes, I feel you are stressed and scared. Come to me. Come. When I say come to me, I create a resonance between my nervous system, my physical and emotional nervous system. That clicks into my daughter's nervous system, or she clicks into mine. It's like a USB plug, clack. And she feels felt. I feel you feeling me. She feels felt by me. She sees that she has my full attention. That creates a nervous system's co regulation. Her nervous system relaxes the stress downgrades the fear, she feels safer. And then I ask her, okay, tell me what happened. And then I bring rational leadership or parental guidance into the mix, but not the other way around. What that does is the second version creates intimacy, co-regulation, turns fear into safety. If my daughter experiences this over and over again, she will feel when I am afraid, there's somebody that is there for me, that is safe. And she learns to regulate her own nervous system more and more fluidly. As she grows up, she takes over more autonomy of that function and she can do it herself and she gets scared. And she will feel there's always somebody that I can come to when I'm stressed or scared. Also later as a grown-up, when I run a company and then I have some issues that are scary, I'll find somebody to connect to. I'm not alone. I don't have to manage alone. People that don't have that will feel in their individuation loop that when I'm afraid, I'm actually on my own. I need to deal with it alone. And then I'll become a leader in an organization that doesn't reach out at the right moment when we really need it, has too much stress, too much responsibility on their shoulders, and actually feels often overloaded. And then when employees come, we also say, oh, no, it's, it's okay. But we are not saying, come to me, come. I know you need something, come. I listen to you. Let me hear what's, what troubles you. And sometimes this takes two, three minutes, five minutes, and it's a completely different experience, creates a very different level of trust. And around a leader like that, you see an ecosystem of trust. People know, oh, it's not a pathology. I just have an emotional request. 
and I have somebody that listens to me. And so maturation is actually the capacity, as you said it beautifully before, that we can host other people inside of ourselves. We don't need to keep the discomfort or the stress of other people outside. I can feel it with you and we ground it together. And then we look for solutions because when we are in a regulated state, we are much better at solutions, finding solutions, developing solutions, and also being innovative and being willing to implement the innovation in the world. So yeah, that's a little bit the flow. And it's yes, no, the freedom to choose between yes and no. In a mature self, I can say yes or no. I'm not bound to one or the other. Because for some people, it's also when we get a bit stuck in the independent part of the story, then we often behave like teenagers that authorities or leadership in the organization, we create often attention because we keep ourselves independent versus interdependent. And that also in many workplaces is an issue. Yes. Okay, I'm going to ask one more question. I could talk for a long time on this topic. Can you describe what it would be like? Imagine you grew a company from scratch and you grew it up in a healthy way. What would it feel like working inside that company? (laughs) That's a good question. I run three companies, so let's see. What's very important to me is a high level of transparency that emotional needs and emotional things are being brought out into the open, that people feel safe enough that we can discuss anything amongst ourselves or in various teams and that the teams are open, that there is enough time and space to do so, even if we have a lot of work, and that we have the maturity to hold disagreements or conflicts that we can stay with it, even if we cannot immediately resolve it, but that we are willing to host them and say, yes, this is part of us for now. And even if we don't immediately find a solution that that's supposed to be here and we will work through it and we will see where it gets us, that we have a a high level of innovative, creative excitement and energy between us so that We are developing constantly whatever is the product or the content of the company, that it feels like it's an emergent process and that we harvest the excitement as our motivation to do what we do. And that we feel, I think, in a company, it would feel like we are also, we have a mission in society, whatever that mission is, and we are contributing to society. And of course, A part of what we do is based on economy and business and revenue. And a part of what we are doing is a giving back to the society that is like an open giving. And I think that element, even if it's a smaller part, but that part, I think, is part of health. That's part of the collective good. And I think if many organizations do that, then we have an open collective flow that supports parts of our society that really need support. And so it's part of the collective intelligence to do so, I believe. And that leadership is not power over, but leadership is relational, is conversational, is based on competence, that not everybody has the same competence. And we listen to each other who brings something in, has a a voice, and it's a creative process. So that we really feel we are like a collective together and we work as a collective and still we know that there are different competencies and we trust those. They also have a leadership voice where they're supposed to have a leadership voice. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to come on the show today. And where can people learn more about you and your work? Yeah, definitely on my website, thomashubel, H-U-E-B-L dot com, thomashubel dot com. We have a big summit every year where we bring luminaries and great voices together to look at collective trauma, collective healing. It's the collective trauma summit dot com. And we also have an NGO that works on collective trauma issues, the pocketproject.org and my books and a lot on the internet. 
thank you very much for coming today. Thank you. It was a very lovely conversation. Thank you for the thoughtful questions and participation in the conversations. It was great. Thank you how you're hosting this. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Work for Humans. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a five-star rating wherever you listen to podcasts. And share the show with one person you think would get value from it. Believe it or not, this really helps us grow the show and reach more people who want to build the kind of work that people really want. As always, thank you to my producer, Jason Ames at Ninth Path Audio for his insights into content and his high standard for quality. Final note, the opinions shared here are my own and not the views of Google or Cisco Systems. Thanks again for listening. See you next time.